Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jana Clements, and I'm going to be giving you an introduction to self-directed education. I've been told that I have 40 minutes to speak and 20 minutes for questions, and I can do that if need be, but I suspect that once you've heard what I have to say, you're likely to have a lot of questions. People usually do. So also self-directed education, the thing I'm here to talk about, holds that people learn a lot more by asking questions than they learn by passively listening to people telling them what to think. So I'm going to propose that I spend a short time giving you some context, and then I'm going to spend the bulk of the time we have together engaging with what it is that you want to know about SDE, because that's how self-directed education works. So firstly, in addition to having written several books on self-directed education, I'm a co-founder of a self-directed education setting called Riverstone Village. Now, one of the young people who chooses to self-educate with us has a granddad, and that granddad's name is Eustace Davy, and he wrote a book called Unchain the Child. And this book explains how laws that make schooling compulsory turn children into victims of a monolithic system that transfers decision-making over education to politicians and government officials. Now, many of you may already be familiar with this book, given that it was published by the Free Market Foundation. If you're not, in this book, Eustace Davy shines a light on the problems that result from coercive, centralized control at a macro political level. I'm here today to shine a light on the next level down. I would like to illuminate the problem of coercive, centralized control within schools. The coercive, centralized control that children directly experience when confronted in an ordinary way, not necessarily by someone with handcuffs, like in this picture, which is an extreme, but simply with a teacher teaching them a class, according to a curriculum that the child does not have a choice about, insisting that the child learn what is taught, pass tests on what is taught, do projects and homework and exams on this material, and the child cannot say no thank you, and cannot choose to walk away and go and do something else. So we always assume that this is for a good reason. School has taught us that all young people have to have an education that is imposed on them for their own good and that all we can do is try to make that imposition as painless as we can. If we can actually make it fun for them, then that's the ultimate gold, and that's as much as we can ask for. But is that true? Here's a thought-provoking quote from a paper by Eugene Matisoff from the University of Delaware. He says, modern conventional education is full of impositions on its students, such as what, how, and where students do, learn, behave, attend, participate, and communicate in the ways that the teacher and school define. For certain ages of students, schooling itself is compulsory in modern societies and thus imposed. However, the legitimacy of this imposition, how much of this imposition is necessary, useful, justified, and desirable for education itself has not been specifically discussed and analyzed yet. Now, I know that until a decade and a half ago, I had no idea that there was actually no research into whether the way we generally do schooling is actually optimal or even necessary. What happened to me is that I registered for a master's degree in the philosophy of education in order to learn about deeply alternative education, only to discover that the university I was paying was not really able to help me. You see, as Eustace Davy points out, our current educational systems are supply driven rather than demand driven. And this applies not only to the provision of institutions, but to the provision of curricula. You cannot simply study whatever it is you want to learn about. You have to study what your professors or your teachers want to supervise or teach. If you want to study something that's outside of the menu, sorry for you, uh, which is why I had to self-direct my own education by putting together what I needed to learn um, using every resource I could lay my hands on and why it took me over a decade to achieve what I wanted to achieve. The problem is that in the times we live in, with innovation booming on every front, this is a real problem. How has it come to be acceptable that we have to take what we are given instead of get what we actually want? Why are there not more people making a fuss about this? This is where things get circular because I've come to understand that the reason we generally just roll over and accept that engaging with any kind of formal education structure involves being told what to learn is because education structures train us 
to accept that the role of educational structures is to tell us what to learn. So whether it's a public government school or one of the most affluent private schools, how many parents think about that school they have chosen for their offspring as a place that has been primarily designed to use coercive control to achieve long-term obedience conditioning? Teach the dog to sit, teach the child to sit still, train the dog to salivate at the sound of the bell, even though the sound of the bell is not edible. Give the child approval to get them to think they love doing worksheets. Get the dog to use a, used to a collar and leash. Give the child lots and lots and lots of practice doing what they're told. Teach the children that there's only one right answer, that authority provides that answer, and that any answer that authority disapproves of must be wrong. Teach the child that challenging authority is terminal. Get permission even before you can eat, rest, or pee. Just in case you might recover your autonomy after hours, do your homework, study for your exams. This is what you will do with your childhood years. Authority has laid out a path for you, and that is what you will strive to complete. Wear a uniform, do what everyone else is doing, follow the leader. No, you don't get to choose the leader, but as a special reward in some places, once you get old enough, we might let you help choose a few of the leader's minions, so you get the illusion that you're empowered. Oh, and after all that, we still expect you to be capable of initiative and critical thinking. And now we wonder why we're in the pickle that we are today. Why do those of us who believe in freedom and empowerment tolerate this kind of education, even pay people to impose this kind of education on our offspring? Two reasons. Firstly, we ourselves went through the same conditioning and sadly, it's effective. We are told that we must send our children to school. So we do, because we learned to do what we're told. And everyone else does it, and we've been trained to do what the herd does. We were also told that education can only happen like this. How does education happen? School is the right answer. Which brings us to the second reason we accept this. The second reason we accept obedience conditioning instead of education for our offspring is that we don't know what other options there are. We're sold the story that obedience training is just a small part of the packaging that makes wonderful liberations such as literacy, maths, science, humanities, and even life skills possible. Children have to have lessons imposed on them. There has to be a set curriculum. There have to be teachers shaping the kids. You just can't get an education without imposing things from the top down. But I'm here to tell you that this story is a myth. We now have a hundred years of evidence that children do not need to be coerced in order to learn. We have 52 years of evidence that they don't even need a curriculum. Education does not have to be supply driven in the sense of imposing a pre-designed curriculum. Education can truly be demand driven in the sense of allowing young people to learn what, how, when, and with whom they choose to all the way. It turns out that young humans are hardwired to learn, and it's almost impossible to stop them. Those schools do seem to try. The direct experience in self-directed education is that young people who are treated with respect for their autonomy and given access to supportive peers and adults within a rich environment successfully self-educate with no imposition of lessons or curricula whatsoever. In an SDE environment such as the one I work at, the only limits on children's autonomy and self-determination are the rights of the people next to them. There are rules to be followed, but they help make the rules. There is no authority except that which exists by consent of the governed. Each and every young person is in charge of their own time and their own choices, and they grow in freedom, growing up into readiness for more freedom. Literally, kids in SDE play all day. There's no distinction between work and play. Playing at tree climbing, playing make-believe, playing at learning to read, playing in the mud, playing at algebra, playing house, playing at chemistry, playing Dungeons and Dragons, playing at computer programming, playing at getting fit, playing at making money, it's all play because it's all voluntary. It's all because it feels like the best thing to do with their time right now. It's all what they've chosen for themselves and they don't have to justify their choice to anyone else to be allowed to do it. The people behind coercive schooling model believe that freedom is dangerous. 
people cannot be trusted and must always be controlled. Teaching them to accept control as children will prepare them to accept control as adults. The myth we have been fed tells us that giving children this kind of freedom should be even more of a disaster than giving freedom to their parents. However, what 100 years of Summers Hill School and 52 years of Sudbury Valley School show us is higher than average rates of functional literacy and higher than average rates of tertiary success. But if what I'm saying is true and education happens optimally when there's no obedience conditioning involved, why do the governments of the world continue to sanction and encourage primarily those forms of public and private education that do use obedience conditioning? Why indeed? Imposing a curriculum through coercive teaching and using methods that instill conformity and obedience is not only not necessary for education, it's counterproductive to the kind of education we want for our young people today. If we want empowered critical thinkers who know how to handle their freedom, why send them for 12 years of obedience training? And even um, now, artificial intelligence pioneer Seymour Papert a number of years ago estimated that human knowledge had re reached the point where the most comprehensive curriculum imaginable can only cover one billionth of 1% of what has been documented so far of human knowledge. Who is the best person to choose? Which particular billionth a particular individual most needs to know? Self-directed education is education that puts teachers and curriculum out in the optional zone. Kids can use them if they want to, and sometimes they even do. Mostly young people pursue their personalized interests using skilled and informed peers and adults as their assistants at their request as needed. And it makes for a very happy childhood and an awesome education. And now I'm at the point where I could carry on talking to you for the next two years before running out of things to tell you. So I think it's time for questions and I'd love to find out what it is that you would like to know. And I've also just only now realized that my name is not Andre Clements. That's my darling husband. So just so you know who's answering your questions, I'm going to rename and yeah. Okay. Well, th thank you very much for that brief talk, and uh, it speaks, I think, to a lot of uh, you know people on this channel that school felt like felt like a prison to most of us. You know, we felt com we felt compelled to learn things you you know you were going to forget afterwards, and that's why you didn't pay attention. So I've got a few questions here in the chat, and then I guess people will have to ask uh, verbal questions. So first one is, what's the concise definition of self-directed education? I hope that question is not too basic. Is it not about the individual being enabled to find and choose uh, what they really want to do slash study? So minimum freedom to choose um, what I or anyone wants to study, including at university. Will this not be easier with the current technology driven environment? We are now in the 21st century. But on the other hand, do kids need some guidance? So there's about four questions wrapped yes. into one there, huh? That's right. <laughs> so self-directed education looks at firstly a definition of education as everything that the learner needs to um, the skills and knowledge that they need in order to live life successfully. And obviously success is going to be something that the individual has to define for themselves. And that's gonna be a hugely different definition for me than for you than for anybody else. So it's not confined to conventional academic learning, but it obviously has to take into account all of the skills that we need for life, including being able to read, being computer literate, being able to manage our money, um, and then whatever specialized skills and interests we personally need in order to live the life that is uniquely mine. Um, you're gonna to have to help me keep up with all those bits of the question. So let, I'm gonna jump around a little bit there because that ties in with do children actually need some guidance? Yes, I think um, that's the important one. That children definitely need one. support for sure. Um, it's one of the main optimizing um, conditions of self-directed education that they have a lot of access to a wide variety of informed adults who are ready to assist them. But the critical thing is that those adults have to, have to act as helpers not as judges. 
Um, and this is beyond the scope of, of a quick uh, talk like this, but um, anyone familiar with um, DC and Ryan's um, work on um, self-determination theory, looking at motivation, it's very, very easy to see that the moment that you start over guiding somebody, you actually start interfering with their need for autonomy. Um, you start undermining their sense of competence um, and neither of those things is any good for learning. So we're actually sabotaging education all the time by giving children a lot more guidance than they actually need. For example, um, I've just written a booklet for Dyslexia Month, um, mm -hmm. looking at the fact that in self-directed education, dyslexics don't develop a reading problem because there's no imposition around learning to read. They can learn to read as late as they like, they can learn in whatever way they like. It looks like our imposition of reading instruction actually creates the reading problem that comes along with the dyslexic mind in school, which is mind blowing to me. That is fascinating given that I've, I've got friends and family that are dyslexic. Um, yeah. I, I wanna ask you a question on two books. One you would know, uh, Free to Learn by Peter Gray, yes. obviously is the, I guess the, God, the godfather of, of self-directed education or is definitely a very impactful one. It's my fiance gave me this book. Um, so Peter Gray in this book, um, and by the way, the, 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 the title of the book you would see, it is recommended by Steven Pinker, the, the big philo philosopher. He said, everyone needs to learn this, read this book. Um, the how he phrased it, he said he, he looks, for example, at the Khoi Sun in, in South Africa, and it, you know, it's every South, most people in this common are South African, and he looks at the way how they teach their kids, and he says that, um, you know, the structure which they have makes sense, but obviously the environment that they live in, you know, equips the kids for those environments. So the point is, you keep the same structure and you change the environment, right? And yeah. this is the self directed education model, but why is it that if this is so obvious and it's so inherent in human nature? that the current institutions of indoctrination of schooling have a completely different you know method what what went wrong or what went right I, I, like how did we get where we are so i mean you've mentioned the koi sun there but i mean it's really it's not only the koi sun um peter gray actually started out studying sudbury valley school and he was trying to figure out does that work and if it does why and he went to speak to anthropologists because he's um, actually an evolutionary psychologist. So he was like, uh, what have we evolved with? What are we actually adapted for? Um, you know, what, what have we been doing for the longest time? And he found that it was pretty much all the hunter-gatherer cultures um, who had this non-coercive approach to education. And if you look back through human history, um, you'll see that the majority of people learned most of what they needed through things like free play, uh, watching what the adults were doing, being completely integrated into the village life, and as they got into their teens, going to things like apprenticeships, none of which looks at all like our modern education system. So our modern education system came in literally for the purposes of indoctrination. Okay, so um, it, you, know, you, you have Calvin wanting to make sure that everybody believes what they should believe. For example, you have um, uh, Germany you with have the army, Germany the Germany wanting yeah. to train up soldiers. You have um, the need for factory workers who can follow instructions um, and, and, and follow senseless, meaningless instructions, um, but still be literate and numerate, have a high tolerance for boredom. So it's, it's really when people have been taken away from their, their natural drive to self-fulfill that you get this coercive education system coming along. Um, but of course, it was enormously useful for, um, you know, sort of spreading, you know, spreading culture. Um, and that's where it became compulsory all over the place. Um, it's a very, very good way to um, make your population predictable is to try and standardize them. Oh, yeah. So unfortunately, we bought it. But, but you know, okay, we, I guess we can ask you know questions if it actually works. And I, my my theory has always been works for certain kids. You know, certain amount of kids get indoctrinated and they flourish in the current education system. And the majority of are just looking at this and saying this is nonsense, and we drop out along the way. I've got a question here from Trevor Watkins who says, "Is there an upper age limit for self-directed education after which you go to more standardized education models?" So actually, uh, quite the contrary, uh, self-directed education is what um, babies do, and it's what you're doing when you learn how to use your new smartphone. Um, it's what you're doing right now by choosing to be here listening to me. Self-directed education actually never stops. Um, it's just that as the individual grows, they're going to have different needs, and therefore they're going to tackle different stuff. So just for example, in the example I gave earlier um, around dyslexia, um, 
some kids who are not dyslexic will still learn to read quite late in self-directed education just because they're busy with other things right now. But there comes a point in their life where they realize I need to be able to do this thing because it's starting to hold me back. And so they inevitably do it, which is why you end up with a 100% literacy rate. So there's no upper age limit where you have to stop self-directing your education and do something else. Now that's very different from saying you never use a curriculum, you never do a course. Um, even young kids in self-directed education can choose to do a course or follow a curriculum. It's just that they very often don't because it's not a very efficient way to learn unless you're learning something that needs that. So for example, I wouldn't recommend learning karate without an instructor telling you what to do. You're probably going to get hurt. Um, but so much in life doesn't really fall under that umbrella. And, and it is also true if you think about it, most of the things that you know in life and that you actually learned is because you were interested in it. The stuff you forgot is what you were not interested in. Yeah, it doesn't stick if you're not interested. You know, even I've even seen people want to want to learn something and it still doesn't stick. So uh, I've got a question here from Leon. He, he says, I, I'm dyslexic and it's been an interesting issue my entire life. I said, does the desire to learn decline with age? If so, your thoughts, like for example, he, he speaks of people like Sam Harris that has pointed out that higher IQ people are less likely to change their minds when confronted by new evidence. Um, they are driven by confirmation bias. So I guess if you get older, do you want to learn less? Um, you know. So again, my experience is that school creates this because yeah. we get trained to fear getting the answer wrong. Um, and if you look at somebody with a high IQ, they probably get a lot of rewards in the school system. Um, so there's a lot of pressure there to, um, you know, to make sure that you do um, stick with what has worked with you before. Whereas if I think of the adults that I can think of who have so-called de-schooled, um, themselves and kind of gone through a reclamation of their um, self-directedness in their education. Um, I mean, my dad's a fantastic example. He's 79 this year. He volunteers at Riverstone Village. He's our school psychologist. Um, and oh, he's constantly on webinars and all sorts of things that he's, he's telling me about. He's just constantly expanding. Um, so so what, no, what do I don't you, think it declines, but I think people get scared of it. So, so what do you, 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 do you tell to those of us who've gone through traditional schooling and, and university and, um, you know, we want to learn, but it's sort of like a mental blockage to learning, you know, how does an adult unschool himself, I guess, before he can start learning? Is there any mm. advice or, you know? Well, my son's working my, on me at the moment because he's um, figured out that I've got a phobia for physics from my school years. <laughs> So he's, he's determined to find the answer. And if I find it, I'll tell you. Um, but I mean, that's a flippant thing to say. Anybody can, to some degree, get over it. I think the critical thing is to get our heads around the fact that there's no one right answer, that nobody else can know what it is that we need, and to try and follow our bliss, to enjoy it. You know, we get this work-play division in our minds. And again, in self-directed education, kids who grow up with self-directed education don't have that. Um, and adults who manage to de-school themselves don't have that. And this is where you find some of your highest achievers in the world don't have a distinction between work and play. Their work is their play. Yeah. And that's why they can achieve what they can achieve because there's no exhaustion. There's no need to stop. It's so, just um, before I go to the next cons, uh, comment, to, to pick up on that from play, um, there's a thing that psychologists called flow, apparently. So, um, yeah. And according to Peter Gray, this is just play. The, the idea of you're, you're so interested in something, you're playing with it and you're freaking figuring it out and driven by your own interest. I mean, if you take, you say, all the great achievers, your Steve Jobs, your Wozniak, your Bill Gates, all these guys could work day Musk. in and day out, Elon Musk's, and they could, you know, wake up and do the same thing the next morning. And, and you ask yourself, a sane person would say, like, but this is crazy. The guy is, is, is working, um, you know, in an extraordinary pace and an ex extraordinary um, determination. And you ask you what, what, what's wrong with him, but it's because he's playing Apple all the time, actually. Yeah. So this is also just if I can interject where people often say, but why, how do you get kids to stick with stuff and persevere and push through when the going gets tough? When people are in play mode, they will push the rock all the way up the mountain without stopping. It's actually easier to keep going when you're in play mode than when you're in work mode. Work mode is not useful. I've got a question here from Bronwyn, and she recently started homeschooling her kids. She was on my stream last night, so um, 
you know, but she's also been reading up on self-directed stuff. So she says, I agree with the concept of making children agents of their own education and taking account of their need to be self-interested in the outcomes. However, I feel that kids may not choose the path later that they choose at an early age. And if they have not mastered foundational skills, this may be, lim may be a limit um, to their options later. How do you react to this? So again, one of the important um, optimizing conditions for self-directed education is the opportunity to play with the tools of the culture. So if you're going to put a kid in an, in an impoverished environment, they're not going to create the foundational skills. But if you're going to give them those optimizing conditions of having access to the people they need and the stuff they need, um, human curiosity tends to do the, the rest. It's very hard to stop a kid from actually getting all the foundational skills they need. But ironically, a lot of those come with free play, largely outdoors with loose parts, etc. Exactly the things we currently deprive young children of when we force them to do a lot of desk work, which is where we also get a lot of learning difficulties. Um, you find kids who can um, climb trees, uh, for example, develop upper shoulder strength that um, prevents, um, I've just gone blank on it, uh, dysgraphia, mm -hmm. for example, um, kids who can skip and hop and throw acorns around, um, start getting the, the fundamental rhythms and patterns necessary for math skills, you know, putting them at a desk too soon is, is pretty much the only thing that you can do to prevent them getting their foundational skills. And as for starting young, um, if somebody has got a one track career, um, you, you get people who are just absolute specialists, they're going to start young and they're going to obsess about it, which is where you get the four year old who just will not let you sleep until they have a violin or just dances the whole day long. Um, but most of us, honestly, especially in this era, um, most of us even listening to this right now have had a number of career changes, haven't we? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm 30 years up. old and I've changed my jobs now. I think it's the fifth job I'm in, you know? Yeah. And what do you need in order to keep up with that? You need to be able to firstly be confident in yourself, which means please don't undermine my confidence in myself and my sense of, co of competence, right? Um, we need to keep our creativity, our flexibility, our social skills. Um, we need to be adaptable. We need to know how to learn without someone teaching us because half of the time we actually have to go and upskill um, without somebody necessarily, um, without having the time and without having the structure to do so. So it's those of us who are actually good at self-directed education who tend to cope well um, with all of the changes in life. Spoon feeding somebody, imposing things on them is really where you do start undermining those really important foundational skills. Just to yeah. reiterate, self-directed education does not see illiteracy or innumeracy develop. It doesn't happen. Um, so just to point out to you, my, my father's listening and he works at a very formal school in South Africa, which I won't name, and he's one of the managers there, and he just says it's a brilliant talk, and it's, it's, very, it's what he's been saying for years about the education system, that they're not giving kids enough time to play. Um, so Leon makes a Sorry, comment here. I just, I just have to interject there, because so many teachers and principals say this. I think, you know, we, we all trapped in the system together, and we all have to break out of it together, um, you know. This is where, you know, I really feel for teachers who are trying to impose this thing and they can just feel that it's not the right thing to do. It's very, very hard. So, so, so what do you, on, on that note then, we have an existing education system and many parents don't have the means maybe to send their kids to a private school. We can talk about the cost maybe afterwards. Maybe it's not as expensive as we think. But, you know, many parents are, are, are middle class in South Africa poor and they have to go to the existing system, right? They have to go to the work school and the school and they have to sing the anthem and all this nonsense. What do you tell to those teachers and those parents in their school? What can they practically do to maybe make the environment, you know, it won't be perfect. It won't be what your school offers, but to make it a bit more tolerable to the kids. Well, the thing is you have to first let the government get the government to allow you to do something different. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's where we've got to realize that there's a vested interest for a lot of governments in not allowing anyone to do anything different uh, because it's very convenient if people can't afford alternatives, because then you can dish out whatever it is that you want swallowed. Um, for parents who can get away with it, just don't make your child do homework and don't make them study for exams. Give them as much free time as possible. Make that free time as interesting as possible. Get them the biggest variety of companions, both adult and young as possible. Take them everywhere you can, even if it's just around the neighborhood. Um, find the interesting people. Take them to see people at work. 
um, you know, find out what they want to do and try and make space for it. For teachers that can get away with it, and some do, um, uh, Ennis Tabong up in, um, uh, what's that? It's like hard of Part of BS Port Dam area, I forget what that is now. Um, for example, um, there's a very nice paper uh, written about an environmental project there that uh, the kids managed to do, testing the local water and complaining to the municipality about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that was completely self-driven. Um, there's a fantastic um, book out by Derry Hannam now, and um, he's a, a long-term school inspector in the in the UK, uh, saying another way is possible. And um, he shares his experience actually doing something like this in the public classroom a number of years ago. But his recommendation is let's start with 20%. Let's give them Fridays to do their own thing. So there are many, many ways that, that one can begin, that one can start to at least um, give kids a chance to not get completely crushed um, by the imposition. Okay, uh, I've, I've got a comment here from Leon Lowe again, who says that uh, my colleague Eustace Davi in his book, The 12 Years Sentence, mm -hmm. says that the idea of uniforms came from the French army, which ran schools and compulsory schooling was at the behest of adult workers who did not want competition. Uh, similar early restrictions on female labor. So I, I think it's basically yeah. what we said, you know, schools is a prison and it was designed to be a prison. Yeah, well, I can tell you that we, I've seen some self-directed teenagers who, you know, are subcontracting for people. People, um, because they're not allowed to work yet because of you know the labor laws um, so yeah I think there's a lot to that okay and there's another question here by Bronwyn she is uh, asks what about fine subtle um, skills like spelling rules grammar etc that are not obvious to easy pick up independently so spelling you will pick up if you read unless you're dyslexic in which case even remedial isn't going to help you pick up spelling and usually in my experience um, you're either going to pick up spelling by reading or you're going to always struggle with spelling because you've got such a brilliant mind that it can think of a hundred ways to spell each word. I mean, it, dyslexia is just a total talent. So that should have been um, my excuse to my teacher. You know. There you go. That's it. Um, and <sighs> grammar, you know, we don't realize how much of the curriculum is not at all necessary for the average person. I mean, I'm always hearing people say, oh, but you definitely need grammar if you want to be a writer. I'm a professional writer. I would have to go and Google what's a past participle at this point, because that's actually for linguistics. It's not actually for daily communication. I need an instinctive grasp of the language, and I need to be able to translate that into the written word. And that requires conversation, not grammar, not, not grammatical exercises, labeling parts of speech. And that's exactly, again, what we're depriving children of is conversation, which is a natural way for humans to learn. And, and on that topic of sophisticated grammar, you can read Stephen Pinker's book, The Language Instinct, where he did lots of studies on people who never went to school in the United States, you know, um, black uh, deprived um, poor blacks in America. He found that the structure of the language is just as complex as yep. ours is. Language is an instinct. It, it's something that I, I, I would like for people to understand is that you acquire a language you know you do not learn a language because somebody is giving you the rules it's complete nonsense it's like a bird that can fly humans have an instinct for languages um, you think of a lot of our famous writers throughout history many of them didn't go to school yeah that didn't is, learn grammar and then they ended up being okay i would like to ask anyone if they want to ask you a like a, you know speak and ask or uh, oral question sure just raise your hands in, uh, in Zoom so I can unmute you, I guess. Or tell me. Uh, Trevor, I... Wait, I need to unmute you. There we go. I'm curious, uh, as you say, there's no upper limit really on, on self-directed education, but are there not some qualifications and skills that are not going to fit well with this? I think of, say, uh, you know, a 17 year old who wants to learn to fly. There's mm -hmm. a whole series of courses that you, you must do. You must be um, uh, tested on them. You must pass at a certain rate before you can move onwards because of the seriousness of what you're attempting to learn. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that you could get yourself a pilot's license by sort of, you know, shopping on the internet for, for topics that interest you. Yes. So 
this is this would fall under you're absolutely spot on this would fall under what i was saying earlier that there are times when self-directed learners choose to take on course and curriculum for a particular purpose like karate i think even more importantly um, something like flying um, that you you would need to actually have somebody to learn from however um, it's probably i'm going to use my educated guess here, probably more effective to learn using a flight sim simulator and a mentor to apprentice to, to learn to be a really good pilot than to go and sit down with a textbook and pass an exam. So this is where the self-directed learner learns to find out what it is they need to access in order to achieve their goal. And they'll do anything to get there. So for example, I know a couple of teens right now who had no interest in foundational maths at all because it's blonking boring. And they're right now doing a NAND to Tetris project, which requires them to build a virtual computer inside another computer to the point that they can play Tetris on it. And that requires Boolean logic, which is quite advanced mathematical. Yeah, this is beyond my head, uh, over my head. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a humanities person. Okay. so. Um, they are, because they're doing that, they're now filling in the gaps that they need to fill in with things like long division. Um, so it's not that self-directed education um, precludes course or curriculum. It's just that it's always um, at the, uh, it's always under the control of the person who's learning. It's never imposed. It's chosen. And therefore it's engaged with, with a very, very different spirit. I mean, I remember in my philosophy class undergrad, we were all completely astounded by this mature student who was a 70 year old woman who'd come into our philosophy class because she actually did the readings. She actually prepared for the tutorials and we couldn't understand why um, because she was engaging as a self-directed learner. So her attitude to the course she was doing was completely different. Is there, is there anyone else with a question? Thanks, thanks for that answer. I don't know if you want to ask. I, I guess the question that, that some parents might ask is, um, how much does this cost? You know, is it is it more expensive? Is it less expensive? I, I mean, you obviously have a private school. So, if we're going to talk at the macro level in terms of the per capita cost of conventional education versus self-directed education, it's much cheaper. Um, if you're going to talk about getting free government education versus having to do this in a private school, it's obviously going to be more expensive. Yeah. Um, depending on how you want to unschool, you know, I know a number of people in forums who are unschooling and doing so cooperatively, and they manage to do so. Um, what I love about this model is, you know, when I first came across it, I was like, wow, this is actually the answer for rural South Africa, because you can do this under a tree. Um, what you need is a couple of good quality adults and an internet connection and away you go. So it's a question of what tools of the culture you can make available to the kids. Um, but in terms of trusting them to self-educate, as long as you can provide those optimizing conditions, it, it really doesn't have to be expensive at all. That's, that's fascinating. Um, Bronwyn, you're next, uh, your question. Uh, I haven't really formulated a clear question in my head. I think I just would like to bounce things off. That's on. great. Um, I've just recently taken, I, I actually met you, I came out to see uh, Riverstone a while back, I don't know if you remember. It's a um, great talk and thank you very much. Um, I have recently started homeschooling my kids and have a, an approach that's, that's quite aligned to what's, to the idea of self-directed education, but, but not quite all the way there because I do still work with the curriculum, but, but I, I prioritize making, um, making sure that the, the kids have an interest in learning what we're, what we're covering. And I felt, found that I can be relatively successful in that, in that, um, you know, I've found ways for them to really enjoy the learning process and and make you know make them quite keen and excited for school, which which has been a really fascinating for me. Yeah. But I can't quite bring myself to sort of abandon the structure, mostly because of my fear of their needing to be integrated when they're older, you know, needing needing to be able to to, to slot into a society that is not based on this mentality, you know, like that they need to have 
you know, it's it's um, a little bit, I don't know if you've seen the film um, Captain Fantastic. Um, I've heard about it and decided not to look at it. I think I heard enough about it, yeah. And I that's, love this. That's, yeah. that's quite extreme, you know, that's not your average unschooling situation, really. But, but you do have to slot into a society where, the, you know, like if you decide you want to work for a particular company and you go and you have, you know, no formal um, qualification or, or, or metric certificate, you know, that it can be really limiting to you. And so mm-hmm. I think the reason that I choose to track with um, the curriculum, even though I don't particularly agree with a lot of, and I leave out a lot too, but, but I want my kids to be able to have the option, you know, if they hit 18 and they go like, actually, I just want to be able to slot in and go and get myself a job, you know, mm. as, a, as a 21-year-old or whatever, um, that they have that option that, that they don't, at the age of 18, have to go, shit, I wish I learned, you know, all those grammar rules so that I could pass my tricky exam. Mm. Um, right. So I just want, yeah. wanted to hear your thoughts on that. So there's two myths operating here. The first myth is if you don't do it by 18, you're sunk. I know so many people all the time who are going and getting their Cambridge at 22, 25, at the point that they need to do it. And there's no problem. And you can usually do it a lot quicker because you're really ready and you're highly motivated. You know why you're doing it. The second myth is that these things are, you know, we we sold the story that if you don't do grade one, you can't do grade two. You can't Mm -hmm. do grade three. If you don't do 10, you can't do 11, you can't do 12. That's also completely a myth. Um, I would prefer to see kids develop their actual important foundational skills, their confidence, their, their life passions, the things that aren't so easy to do when you're over 18. And mm-hmm. at the point that they feel like they need the piece of paper, kids in self-directed education do this all the time. They go and get their piece of paper. It's, it's not a problem. Or they find ways to bypass that piece of paper because they're usually very creative and very determined and highly motivated. So the kids at Sudbury Valley School were famous for, I mean, they never got any piece of paper. They would just write a really convincing letter to the dean and tell him why he had to interview them. And then, you know, um, I mean, there's this one story about a girl getting into MIT because the, the dean thought he was going to interview her to see if she could get in. And she was interviewing him to see if his course was good enough for her, according to her needs. And that's the attitude a real self-directed learner has. Um, so when you talk about integrating back in, I think the issue would be, um, you know, if you want to send them back in January and are you going to give them a six month holiday now, for example, um, What we do see, um, sometimes people move, their circumstances change, or kids just decide they want to try out public school because they've never been there. And what we find is if they have, you know, really self-directed and they really want to do the thing, they can catch up very quickly because it's actually more busy work than we realize, um, the school thing. It's actually not that conceptual. The conceptual stuff tends to come with maturity and life experience. Um, most of what you get in school is just content, which is why it keeps getting flushed after every exam and why parents constantly struggle to help their kids with their homework. How would we ever struggle to help our kids with their homework if this learning was anything other than just this content flow that goes in and then out again? Mm -hmm. So there's not that much catching up to do to get in. Um, You know, if you're dealing with something like maths, then maybe it's going to take a bit longer than if you just have to crash the content on, on a particular subject. Um, mostly it's about learning how to present in the formal education system, how to pass exams, how to write essays. And again, this is something that you can swat. So there's a lot of fear that I think we have just because we haven't de-schooled. And I'm totally with you. You know, I'm, I'm talking to you from the other side of 15 years now, right? Mm-hmm. When I first came across my first unschooling family, I thought they were mad. <laughs> it takes time. Yeah, can, oh, I had a thought and I lost it. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Let, let's go to the next question. So I've got a question of people now watching on YouTube and then they're sending me stuff through WhatsApp and then mm-hmm. other people here. Yeah. So I'm just going to read you uh, one question here. It's in Afrikaans. I'm just translating in my head. Um, what do you think about liberal 
education, I guess is the broader term here, um, that kids should be allowed to question things because according to this person, this is the biggest factor as to why education is failing in South Africa. Well, the thing is that if you don't question things, um, again, this comes back to the beginning of my talk, then what are you doing? You're not doing education, you're doing obedience training. Yeah, so, indoctrination. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if you're going to train people to always think that there's only one right answer and they should never investigate and it's dangerous to ask questions because it's dangerous to ask questions. Um, you know, you, you constantly have kids being shamed and belittled for correcting the teacher. They get marked down for pointing out an actual error that's really there, for example. Um, and, and that happens all the time. You, you're going to kill the desire for learning. I mean, this is an interesting one because I get to see kids who've self-directed all the way and I get to see the kids who come to us from school to over to Riverstone. And most of the ones who come to us from school come in with some degree of allergy to learning. Yeah. Like they don't want to be in the room when maths is happening or they don't read for pleasure um, or you know they don't want to do anything that looks like learning. Whereas the kids who've self-directed all the way don't have that. Um, and so I think squashing that autonomy and, um, you know, forbidding questioning, I mean, that kills curiosity and curiosity is the foundational drive for education. If it's dangerous to ask questions, what's left for you to actually be able to, to accept education if curiosity is, you know, gone to hide? Yeah, then, then you become a very good factory worker for the rest of your life. You know, that's that's about what yeah. all is left. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a question here from someone. And so I'm first reading, so I get questions on WhatsApp. So Trevor, then after this, you're going to get your question. Um, it's how do you deal, I guess, with problem kids, bullies, um, you know, things of this sort. And um, this person knows that you've got judicial meetings. Um, can you explain the disciplinary system and, and this sort of that, that, that aspect of it? Right. So there would be a few different ways to approach that depending on the self-directed education setting. They're not all the same. So Riverstone Village is not the same as, as every other setting. And that, that's partly because of the um, young people being completely equal to the staff and actually structuring the way things happen. So um, it's a completely self-governing system that's very creative and innovative. So um, that group can decide how to deal with these things and that can change over time. And that's, that's the critical thing to understand. Um, but the key thing is that it's not a question of adults imposing authority over young people. So you don't go to the principal to give you a talking to or you know, get detention from the teacher. If you haven't in some way inconvenienced your peers or endangered the system or infringed somebody's rights, then what is there to sort out? And if you have, somebody wants to sort it out with you, right? Yeah. So that'll either be a conflict resolution or it will be your peers deciding with you how to solve that or what you need to do to redress. Um, There's no fist fight on the rugby field afterwards. Or <laughs> well, the thing is this, is that a lot of people don't realize how much of the bullying and you know, discipline problems in school come from the amount of pressure and misery that kids are experiencing. You know, Hurting people hurt people, as they say. Miserable yeah. people make other people's lives miserable. You know, We've had kids come in. I mean, I, I don't want to go into anything that could identify anybody, but let's just say we've had kids come in who were kicked out of other places for being violent with other children, and we've never seen it. We've never seen them behave like that here because they're not miserable anymore. They don't have to look for negative expressions of their autonomy because they've got positive expressions of their autonomy. So that's not to say there's never problems and there's never fights. Sure, there are, but it's just not the same scale. And the thing is that also won't, the moment you've got an imposed authoritarian system, then you have this thing of ratting on people, right? You can't be the rat because then you've sold us out to the man. So things get hushed up um, and things can really get dug in and get very nasty. Whereas if we're all equals here and we're, we're solving problems, who's to get into trouble? How? It's, it's like, it, it's, it's easier on all of us if we can get this solved and get this out of the way because this is unpleasant. Right. So it makes for a very different sort of setup. So the more empowered kids become, Firstly, the less they're going to stand for being bullied. And secondly, the less likely they are to bully. Um, and that, that also speaks to the confidence and, and you know everything that follows from that. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Trevor, you're next with your question. Do you have any record of any notable failures with the system? I'm thinking of the 
kid who decides to get a major in marijuana, Twitter, and Facebook this year and do nothing else. <laughs> so, marijuana, no, because that's illegal, so you couldn't get away with it. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose unless you're in a home and school environment that lets you get away with it. <laughs> I will tell yeah, you a story have, of top things, um, you know, in, I in have school. had experience with kids who came to us addicted to a number of substances and other things who just stopped needing it after a while it's it's kind of the opposite you know we think of addiction as something that people do in a hedonistic sense but actually people do addictions in a misery sense it's an escape from a miserable reality because they don't know what else to do um it is very normal in self-directed education for a kid to do nothing but pay pay like counter strike for a whole year totally normal unless they really have the talents to become a cyber athlete they're not going to do it for much longer than that before they start coming out of their shell and discovering that there's a world around them and this is one of the advantages of a self-directed education facility as opposed to um you know maybe being stuck in a very small environment is that there's so much going on um you get drawn in just a quick observation is can elderly adults come and join your bunch it sounds like utopia we don't officially have an upper age limit we haven't had anyone over 18 sign up yet uh, there could always be a first time but a couple of our older teens now um because we've only we've this particular facility has only been open three years and so some of the older teens are really frustrated that they only got three years of it uh, so they want us to create an ununiversity now um, and yeah, that, that would be awesome. We would really, really want that to be all ages. I've always thought this is a fantastic thing to do for midlife crises, retirement planning. You know, it's like any time that you want to discover yourself. Yeah. We, we call them libertarian seminars. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, um, speaking to that, um, it, it's a point I, I think, I can't remember if you spoke to it in your chat, but repeat anyways with it. There is inter-age mixing at your school, right? It is not a factory line where eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and ten-year-olds go to different classes. And, and speak to the importance of that. That's hugely important. In fact, uh, Daniel Greenberg, the founder of Sudbury Valley School, calls that one of the secret weapons of SDE. So the moment that you're going to age segregate people, or let's say skill level segregate people, if you're going to put everybody together at a level where they've got nothing to teach each other, nothing to learn from each other, that's when you get stagnation. At the same time, the moment that you've got too big a gap, like we usually have when, you know, an adult is trying to explain something to a five-year-old, what's in the adult's mind has got so much context that cannot be conveyed to the five-year-old. Whereas when the seven-year-old is explaining to the five-year-old, they're almost on the same page. That seven-year-old still got continuity with the worldview of the five-year-old. So we find that the, the, the child who's more experienced manages to consolidate what they know by teaching it because the best way to learn is to teach once you've got a certain grasp. Um, and at the same time, the younger one benefits from you know, being inspired by the hero that they're trailing around after. And it's just re really, really beautiful. Um, often people are worried again because they've looked at schooled kids. They're worried about the bullying aspects of teenagers having um, you know, sort of access to, to young kids. Um, but again, in a, in, a, in a positive environment, those interactions tend to actually be very healthy um, yeah. and inspirational. Well, I, uh, I've taken that concept to the work environment, actually, where I've had uh, numerous discussions with my managers and saying, it's better that the interns report to me because I was there four or five years ago, as yeah. opposed to him, because he speaks on a level and a sophistication they just don't understand. And that has solved a lot of problems that... It is a mistake, you know, even a working environment for young engineers not to mentor, you know, interns, for example. Um, you know, it's the, the environment I'm familiar with. And that, that I took from self-directed education. So I'm just saying these things have applications far beyond the schooling. It is not just uh, yeah. in the schooling environment. Um, I think this is natural human learning. Yeah. 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 Bronwyn, I'm going to, to unmute you because I see you've got a question as well. I, uh, sorry, now that we're back on. I actually have two questions. I don't know if I can squeeze them both in. That's right. Here you go. Um, the first one is the the structure, the importance of structure. I know you operate a unschool environment, but it's it's still a structured environment in the sense that you know people arrive, um, they do their thing, and then they go home to their homes again. 
um, how important is that structure, that, that kind of routine of like we come, we do, and then we go? How important is that structure in, in your system? Not at all. Uh, it's circumstantial. If we had a village where they could free range, then we would let them do that. It would probably be a lot better. You know, I've seen biorhythms where kids do, for example, both of my children did almost all of their learning to read very late at night. Never during our, our Riverstone hours. So, mm -hmm. no, uh, you know, the best structure is the structure that comes naturally from the individual. And it's very different from individual to individual. Some people learn in fits and starts. Some people learn in obsessive, nonstop binges. And, and I mean, one, one person can learn that way at one time and the other way another time. Yeah, it really varies. So I, I, I've got a, just a final question here because we have to finish. The next speaker starts mm. at nine. Um, so first, thank you again for coming. And then um, I, I'm getting questions from teachers and, and parents and they're asking me, um, how can they contact you? And then should they can they come and visit the school, I guess, uh, to see how the setup works? Because you've, you've stirred a bit of curiosity. So, uh, yeah, the kids don't particularly like being a zoo. Yeah. So you, you would have to build quite a bit of trust and reputation before you're allowed onto campus during hours. I've got a couple of books coming out um, in print. There's already a bit of ebook um, advance available if you want to have a look at them. Otherwise, just wait a month or two and we'll have them for you in print. Um, the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, um, self-directed.org self has a lot of resources on the web. Um, I'll send you um, my books. I am actually just, if somebody's serious about this, in November, I'm doing another round of facilitator training because I discovered that it didn't exist. I had to create it for myself and our staff and I now offer it internationally. Um, and yeah, my email is the shift will come. The shift will come at gmail.com. Okay, well, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this talk, and we thank highly you. appreciate it. And um, it's lovely being good, here. Yeah, th good. Th thanks for being the pioneer in South Africa with this thing, you know.